I wanted to, uh, couple, there are a couple of things in my talk, um, but Evelyn's talk earlier today actually made me think of where I was in January of 1994. Um, because I wasn't in graduate school yet. I was out of college, but not in graduate school. And when I came to graduate school, all I could hear of was this fabulous conference that I had just missed by a year. And if only I had been in graduate school a year earlier, then I would have gotten to go to this conference. Um, and where I was in January of 1994 um, is actually pretty interesting. I was working in corporate communications at the National Basketball Association. Um, and I was coming to the slow realization that the original work, social science work, quantitative work, that I had done to develop the business plan for the Women's National Basketball Association uh, was something that I would not play a major role in participating in developing. So even though I had come up with the idea and the reason why they play in the summer was my idea and the reason that the NBA should buy it and own it and cut down the overhead was my idea, I would not be permitted to participate in its actual creation, development, or administration. Um, so I actually came to graduate school and to the academic world from an experience of having my work co-opted, of having certain things taken credit for um, in a way that I think has tremendously shaped why these conferences are so important to me and why it's very important to me that I not just recommend whoever the best white male political scientist is on public spheres, but make sure that they read Melissa's book. Make sure that when they're reading black feminism, they're reading Evelyn's book. When they're doing black nationalism and black women, they read Nicole's book. It's just very, very, very important because that goes on not just in the academy, but elsewhere in the uh, corporate world as well. Um, but I also want to just point out today is March 5th, 2009, and yes, we are 15 years later, um, but as Melissa mentioned, I'm now at the University of Southern California, um, and I'm so happy to be here in New Jersey, but I'm cognizant of what's going on in my home state of California today. Um, my thoughts are in Sacramento with my friends and allies in the Barbara Jordan, Bayard Rustin Coalition, who are forced to present a case in the California State Supreme Court that pleads for relief from the tyranny of the majority that occurred on November 4th, 2008. That majority that said that lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgendered people, many of them women of color, including members of my own family, didn't deserve full citizenship. It is in their honor that many of the examples that you're going to see me speak about today actually speak to the validity and the legitimacy of these lives. So when we were talking about continuities and discontinuities, I just want to keep that one discontinuity in our hearts and minds today, particularly in light of the arguments that are being presented by Lambda Legal and their allies today in front of the state Supreme Court. Now, there are a couple of things that I am going to cover in my talk <laughs> and hopefully go very quickly through them so that we can leave enough time for questions. Um, as you can see from the title of my talk, I want to first talk about what I call a cognitive filter of the oppression Olympics and how it describes our current socio-political reality. Um, I've been teaching uh, Elizabeth Martinez's fabulous 1994Z Magazine article for about 10 years in my race and ethnicity class, and every single final exam I have gotten for close to 10 years has the generation, younger generation of undergraduate students saying, we need to go beyond the oppression Olympics. But of course, that's all they can say because we haven't done enough of the work to figure out what in God's name that actually means. Okay, what does it mean to go beyond the Oppression Olympics? So I'm going to talk about the Oppression Olympics and then hopefully get to how we can get beyond it. I also want to, in so doing, delineate between several terms that are often used interchangeably. And we've already started to talk about this with the earlier morning panel. There continues to be a lot of slippage in the usage of the terms intersectionality versus black women's studies versus black feminism or womanism, based largely on the fact that there is still no extant intellectual history of intersectionality. There are many, many wonderful anthologies, but there is no intellectual history that takes us from point A all the way up till 2009. Um, and hopefully I can correct that. I then want to conclude by arguing that intersectional solidarity is the best solution to the oppression Olympics. Now, we've talked about Barack Obama and Michelle Obama already, or as I like to say, President and First Lady Obama. That never gets old. <laughs> If I've learned anything from the 2008 Democratic primary season, though, it's that thinking of intersectionality as simply a content area won't get us past this idea of the oppression Olympics. We have to think about intersectionality's paradigm-shifting normative tenets and what they can contribute 
beyond just what they contribute to black women and the black women's studies to what they can contribute to a larger, more just world. So let's turn briefly to this idea of the Oppression Olympics. And I'm not seeing my, there it is, my cursor. Okay, here we go. Now, when we talk about the Oppression Olympics, and hopefully this will be visible to all of you, but uh, I will definitely make sure we walk through the slide. These rings, of course, are not looking like the Olympic rings on purpose, because these are all things that I consider to be democratic challenges. They are problems that we have in our socio-political context. First one I want to talk about is in the center. It's called leapfrog paranoia. And if you went to the True Colors tour over the course of the past summer, Cindy Lauper and many other different 80s bands were performing. Wanda Sykes, the famous comedian, was also part of that lineup. And she said very specifically to African Americans in her stand-up routine on this tour, Black people, gay people are not looking to jump in front of you in the oppression line, okay? When I talk about leapfrog paranoia, that's exactly what I'm talking about. This idea when we have an oppression Olympics that everybody is competing for that gold medal of most oppressed, right? And so like day one event, leapfrog paranoia. Who can actually get us beyond, you know, and get to that title of most oppressed, okay? The second ring that I want to talk about here is willful blindness. And again, we can go back to the 2000 primary campaign. And willful blindness involves exclusive focus on one's own victimhood, with no recognition that the privilege of other categorical memberships might actually confer. So if we think about the quite legitimate hand-wringing that took place in the Hillary Clinton campaign about sexism, there was no recognition, save for that one little interview she probably wishes she hadn't given to USA Today, that she was also a racially privileged woman. So when she talked about, you know, there are these hard-working Americans, white Americans, that would never vote for Barack Obama, of course, the definition of a political gaffe is not that something's not true, it's that you shouldn't have said it, okay? <laughs> and so this gaffe actually revealed part of the campaign's willful blindness to see her as simultaneously privileged and disadvantaged. They were very happy to talk about her as a victim of sexism, but didn't want to con recognize that there might have been this racial privilege that got her free votes. Okay, they didn't vote for her because she was the most qualified. They voted for her out of the concept of right privilege. Third ring up here, defiant ignorance. Best exemplified by the bumper sticker, what are you pretending not to know? Defiant ignorance denies the existence of any and all victimhood or stratified systems of political power. Often linked to stories of American exceptionalism and Horatio Alger uh, visions of success, it's a defense mechanism, okay, designed to resist responsibility for the advantage that we get from inegalitarian traditions in the United States. Now this actually draws upon the logic enumerated by Charles Mills in The Racial Contract, for those of you who have read it, which discusses the epistemology of ignorance that is required in order for white supremacy to persist as an organizing force in society. And of course, Beverly Tatum has also done work on this with, from the psychological perspective. Fourth, movement backlash. Privileged groups, we know, based on the ways in which marginalized groups are able to act and create social movements to create change, privileged groups then counter social movements with attempts to recast themselves and their hegemonic practices as the true victims, right? So that we have this idea of reverse discrimination. So the true victims of affirmative action, the true victims of public policy are these people who are supposed to have access to not just some of the slots for college admissions, for hiring, for any number of different political uh, kinds of resources, but they're supposed to have access to all of the slots, right? So they're the true victims of this idea of trying to have a more egalitarian uh, hiring or admissions policy. Similarly, what we've seen with regard to same-sex marriage is that traditional marriage is the victim. It's under attack. If you listen to Pastor Rick Warren, if you listen to many of the people in California who were in favor of Prop 8, it was traditional marriage is under attack. It's been this institution for 5,000 years and it's now a victim of what was called, and I love pointing out the irony to my African-American Prop 8 supporters, uh, what was called a radical state Supreme Court. So a radical set of nine justices. And though I often ask African-Americans, 
do you remember what they said about that radical set of nine justices who voted in 1954 and said separate is inherently unequal? They said nine radical justices. Okay. So this idea of movement backlash is also critical to the oppression Olympics. Last but certainly not least is compassion deficit disorder. And uh, as three of the four members of this panel have very close familial ties to the New Orleans area and the Gulf Coast, I think that we all saw compassion deficit, deficit disorder, excuse me, compassion deficit disorder on full view when we saw the failed response to Hurricanes Katrina and Rita. And so I don't want to get too much into that one in the interest of time, but I'm happy to answer questions about it moving forward. Now, when we talk about the roots of intersectionality theory, I don't think that most of us have, uh, I don't have to go through this in too much detail, but we know, of course, that intersectionality theory does have multiple roots in terms of its intellectual history. The idea of analyzing race, gender, and class identities together has existed for over a century. Um, I quoted this directly, and in the, the book where this comes from, um, I cite Beverly Guy Sheftall's Words of Fire, um, who has talked about the idea that from an historical perspective, the call for recognition of multiple categories is as old as the works of Maria Stewart in the early 1800s and Anna Julia Cooper in the late 1800s and early 1900s. Both of them acknowledge that black women in the U.S. have unique perspectives or standpoints that should enrich both the black public sphere and the larger mainstream culture. Now, it would be anachronistic to claim that Stuart or Cooper were intersectional thinkers, but they helped originate the claim that was later popularized in black feminist thought of both and identities and their unique role. Now, of course, black feminists in the second wave of the women's movement and the modern civil rights movement took up this notion and demanded that black, women and black men and white women avoid pressuring black women to choose race or to choose gender. Of course, Patricia Hill Collins most uh, famously popularized this, but many other black feminists have also contested her version of this. And then we have Kimberly Williams Crenshaw, who offered us the name intersectionality and the original metaphor. And so I want to move to the next slide that kind of attempts to visually describe what Crenshaw was talking about in mapping the margins. And so here you can see that what she's talking about in terms of intersections is that you have different categories that are then, is, is streets would intersect, coming together in what I have here is probably a more best described as a roundabout. This has been encapsulated in the Canadian courts, for example, who've actually taken what Crenshaw said and tried to implement it as a form of public policy. And so there are a number of different images that we could use for intersectionality, but I want to just have this central image here in mind because as we've moved forward, we've gotten away from the idea that we have intersecting streets for a number of reasons. We've also gotten away from this image based on the idea that we have more than just these three categories. So we always think of the traditional triumvirate of race, class, gender. We've thrown in sexual orientation, of course, and we've also thrown in other categories such that if we were to continue with adding categories, we would get to this idea of race, gender, sexual orientation, class, disability, nation, you could go around the world essentially with many of these categories. What's next happened is that in terms of dynamic content-based intersectionality, we've started to recognize that these are not simply static categories. These are collections of both identities and political practices that are negotiated on an ongoing basis. And so you move to an idea of intersectionality as a series of processes. And one of the things I want to point out about this slide that's particularly important is the idea of the connections between each of the categories. You'll see that none of these connections, and this is what intersectionality scholarship has moved to, none of these connections are identical. So you have a black and blue connection between sexuality and racing. You have an orange and blue connection, very thin blue line between nationalizing and gendering. And you do that to recognize the fact that the relationships between the categories is an open empirical question. We're not sure how those categories are going to relate to each other until we take on a specific kind of research project. Now last but certainly not least, one of the things that has inspired people who do intersectionality research in political science to move away from thinking about categories is not just that, from an empirical or quantitative perspective, you never know where to stop, right? So how many categories is ever legitimate to actually include in your projects? 
It's also because we need to think about the idea that attention to multiple categories doesn't fundamentally get what we're interested in, which is the actual relationships between the categories and how they function in any given society. So we've moved further towards something that I call research paradigm intersectionality. And so here you can see we're not talking about specific race, class, and gender kinds of things, but we're talking about the relationships between and drawing upon black women's studies and black feminism You'll see, and I'm gonna go counterclockwise here, you'll see categorical multiplicity as being part of the first original claim, that multiple categories matter. That these claims intersect in terms of categories is something that also comes from black women's studies and black feminist thought. And then if you skip over the one and move to diversity within, that's the third central contribution from black feminist theory and black women's studies. On the other hand, we now have three different schools of intersectionality research. So if you read what's been published in the North American context, you're gonna get a very critical legal studies, critical race theory kind of approach to intersectionality. On the other hand, if you read the European school, and there was just a conference last month in Frankfurt to celebrate the 20th anniversary of really Crenshaw's uh, actual uh, publication, you start to think about things like time dynamics and intersection in terms of hybridity and notions of hybridity, dependent on some of the research and cultural studies that's been done. So there is this inherent interdisciplinarity, but it happens to be very regional in its kind of makeup. Last but certainly not least, if you look at the developing world school or approach to intersectionality, they have a very big focus on people who are doing individual institutional relations. So looking at the ways in which people are navigating and negotiating the political institutions or the economic institutions with which they are forced to contend. So research paradigm intersectionality attempts to bring all three schools contributions together to really think through intersectionality at a, a different level of analysis. So what does all of this mean in terms of intersectional solidarity? Well, I think if you take intersectionality and look at it as contributing these kinds of approaches to how we study women of color or any population, regardless of whether it's women of color or not, you get three central contributions. The first is that you have a new way for the privilege to stand in solidarity with those who are marginalized, okay? When you start to open up the ways in which these categories and examine how these categories interact, you start to look at the ways in which solidarity can actually be something that can exist in a productive way, meaning in an empowering way rather than a patronizing way. Now, black feminists, I would argue, are one of the people, one of the groups that actually talked about and taught people how to actually stand in solidarity. And I think that intersectionality starts to carry that a bit further. The second benefit, of course, is what Kathy Cohen in 1997 talked about in her article in GLQ, counterintuitive coalitions. So once you start to look at the ways these things fit together, you start to say, wow, these people who we never thought had uh, anything in common, e.g. women on welfare and members of the gay and lesbian movement, you might actually see a beneficial coalition that could exist there because they both represent challenges to the heterosex heterosexist familial norm in this country. So that there might be fruitful coalitions that people would have never come up with on their own until you have this intersectional analysis. So, Intersectional solidarity is something that I think we can talk about in the Q&A. Um, I chose, obviously, to focus on the more research-oriented side of my career, but I'm also happy to answer questions in the Q&A about the more personal side because we have had, I think, a beautiful uh, conversation so far uh, in that mode as well. Okay, thank you. <laughs>